Welcome and thank you for joining today's event on accelerating innovation and learning for adaptation in the context of Early Warnings for All initiative. Today's discussion aims to demonstrate the common challenges and opportunities to accelerate adaptation efforts under the Early Warning Services for All initiative. Drawing from experiences, lessons learned, and innovation multipliers from different stakeholders' perspectives, context, and hazards. As background, the Early Warning Services for All is a groundbreaking initiative to ensure that everybody and everyone on Earth is protected from hazardous events, weather, or climate events through life-saving early warning systems by the end of 2027. As part of the UN Secretary General's um, acceleration agenda, the Early Warnings for All initiative launched during COP27 in Sharm el Sheikh last year is a key contribution to delivering climate justice to those at the front lines of the climate crisis. It aligns with key priorities of the Paris Agreement, loss and damage, and the global stock take, while also supporting key provisions of the Sendai Framework for Disaster Risk Reduction, particularly Target G on availability and accessibility of multi-hazard early warning systems. Furthermore, it also contributes to delivering the targets of the 2030 Agenda for Sustainable Development on poverty, hunger, health, water, clean energy, climate action, and sustainable activities and cities. At the start of COP, the WMO launched the provision of the 2023 state of, Global State of Climate Report. It is virtually certain that this year will be the warmest on record, with El Nino conditions in the equatorial Pacific currently developing, we would anticipate a further spike in the temperature during 2024. The concentration of greenhouse gases in the atmosphere once again reached a new record last year. Global average concentrations of CO2 in 2022 were 50% above the average pre-industrial uh, for the first time. Global mean sea level temperatures record observed in 2023, which reflects continued ocean warming, as well as melting of the glaciers and ice sheets. And Arctic sea ice were at its lowest during February 2023. Mediterranean Storm Daniel led to thousands of lives lost in Libya, <clears throat> and droughts combined with extreme and prolonged summer heat over large parts of Northern Hemisphere and other parts lead led to unprecedented deadly fires in some countries. All of this resulting in more extreme with far-reaching impacts on people and society. This won't be short-lived. Given global trends, global temperatures are likely to surge to record levels in the next five years. Temporarily breaking the 1.5 degrees Celsius threshold set in the Paris Agreement for at least one year between now and 2027. Colleagues, the moment to act on multi-hazard early warning systems is now. We must get together of hazardous events and protect lives and li livelihoods. All countries feel the impact of climate change, but not all have the same resources and capabilities to anticipate, community, communicate, and protect. This is a common and shared responsibility that we can only meet together as United Front. Since launching the Early Warnings for All Initiative Action Plan in Sharm el Sheikh last year, we have advanced progress together in a number of countries to ensure effective multi-hazard early warning systems and protecting the people that need um, this from all of us and therefore accelerated efforts is well known. Practically speaking, we look forward to working with all our partners in the coming year to enhance our support countries in better understanding and mapping their risks, deploying adequate observations systems and monitoring systems, and boost their prediction and forecasting capabilities to anticipate hazards, as well as leveraging on the ICT um, cell broadcast to understand such, such as the Common Alert Protocol 
um, to disseminate warning information to all the people who may be at risk, while also support preparedness, anticipatory action um, efforts. Good. Together in this room today, I would like to recognize that we are in all of this together. Let us learn with and from one another to help push forward innovation and progress in ensuring everybody is protected by multi-hazard early warning systems. Let us visualize and co-create a new future where lives are not lost. We are more resilient to navigate the climate challenges with dignity and trust. With that, I hand over to colleague Laurie to share more details on the early warnings for all a progress and the way forward. I thank you, Laurie. Thank you very much, uh, Johan. Uh, my name is Loretta Heber Girarde. I'm with the United Nations Office for Disaster Risk Reduction. I'm one of the pillar leads, but before I launch into um, the presentation on the current status of early warning systems, I would like to introduce two of the other pillar leads that are in the room, uh, because along with WMO, these other two organizations have actually been critical for um, helping us collectively reach where we are now today. So Vanessa Gray, who is the pillar lead of Pillar 3 uh, from the ITU, and, and Jonathan Stone, who is the pillar lead of Pillar 4 from the IFRC. And I hope they will get the chance to take the floor as well and to share their experiences in working together and really um, this collective effort, this joint effort, this collaborative effort to help countries put in place effective early warning systems. What I'd like to do now is just share with you some of the updates that we have compiled in a report that is being launched at this COP on the status of early warning systems in the world today. So what I would like to start with is to let you know that there is progress being made, and that's critically important. We sometimes paint a gloomy picture when we talk about the fact that many countries are still not seeing early warning systems in place that are protecting all citizens equally from extreme weather events. But nonetheless, there is some good news, and I'd like to start with that. For example, we know now that 91% uh, of the world's population now lives in a country that is implementing a common alert protocol. And we also have tremendous opportunities with the fact that 95% uh, of the world's population has access to mobile broadband networks. So this is really an opportunity to reach people who have mobile phones. And we know that uh, the evacuations that are occurring now are growing, although it is still different uh, between regions, but over 0.25 uh, billion people were evacuated last year, which means that they had the opportunity to save their lives in the face of an incoming disaster event. So progress is being made. However, it's not uh, across the board. And despite this progress, we know even in countries that are um, investing heavily in early warning systems, there are still gaps. And often these gaps are not necessarily just around one pillar. You'll see from the chart that pillar one is still you know, one of the least invested uh, pillars, but also how the pillars connect to each other. So is the risk knowledge really being used along with the uh, information on observations um, to trigger warnings in time? And are those warnings that are being triggered actually leading to early action? It's those connections that we need to work on a bit more. So with this, we have to say the glass is really half full. Um, rather than half empty, it's half full, but it's still only half. And that means that we really do need to double down on our efforts. So we know now that more countries are reporting on the existence of multi-hazard early warning systems. Um, we need to increase the reporting, so part of the effort that we are making is also improving and supporting countries to uh, do a better job of reporting on the existence of the various elements of early warning systems. So we have an important component on monitoring and evaluation which is being scaled up so that we can tell the story of how progress is being made in countries. 
Um, we also can see that the scores, it's a little bit technical, but we ask countries to score themselves on various components of early warning. These are increasing. So countries themselves are telling us that various elements associated with their early warning systems are improving over time. But there are still substantial gaps. I've mentioned uh, risk knowledge uh, because currently, this is actually the pillar that UNDRR leads, is still underinvested. And, and the reason this is important is because we need that risk information to identify which groups are most vulnerable, where's the highest levels of exposure lie, how do we identify those population groups that are least likely to be reached with an alert or a warning. So really more investment needs to go in there. But across the board, we need to scale up, and we need to scale it up across the four pillars and in support of the national systems. Sometimes it occurs to me that people understand early warning sprawl as a project that is being led by the UN and the Red Cross. It's not a project, it's a goal, it's an initiative which is aiming to catalyze political support and to catalyze investment for countries, on behalf of countries, but above all, led by countries to build their early warning systems. So what are we doing concretely? Um, we are working collaboratively on multiple areas, but one of this is, as mentioned before, this really critical interpillar coordination approach. And some of the knowledge and the learning that we have gathered to date shows us that it's these disconnects that occur that often lead to higher losses and damages over time. An alert is issued, but it isn't received at the local level. An alert is issued, but it isn't um, informed by a good understanding of where the greatest risks lie, et cetera. We have developed a programming approach, a five-year implementation plan, 18-month work plans, um, a toolkit that countries are currently using to scale up their programming, and the four pillars are working together on donor funds and donor proposals, and we've actually been very gratified by the support we've received, including by the Green Climate Fund, but other donors as well, the Dutch, Sweden, uh, Denmark, amongst others, who are not just funding one agency, but funding the four pillars to work collaboratively in countries, and we think this is a really important advance. We've also working on helping countries identify their gaps. And the aim with the Early Warnings for All initiative is to ensure a minimum core capability for all countries. It's not to see some countries have this wonderful gold standard and other countries really being left behind, but helping all countries reach a minimal core capability. And so we are working with countries to help them understand the gaps that they have and to prioritize filling these gaps. Also, one of the key elements that we have been seeing in the countries is that often early warning systems are characterized by standalone projects. Uh, the aim for us is really a coordinated approach, whereby these projects add up together to a comprehensive early warning system. And so we have been helping countries identify how to put in place a roadmap, a national strategy, an action plan that pulls together these different investments under one strategy led by the authorities, but very much in conjunction with civil society, academics, and the private sector. So really a whole of society approach. These country level uh, rollout workshops have been generating political commitment to early warnings for all. And we have just come back ourselves from Mozambique uh, last week, uh, but I would like to share with you a little bit more on what's happening at the country level. So it's really, taking stock of what is the status of early warning in a country and how are you aligning the various programmatic elements, which may be funded by the World Bank, it may be funded by the government, it may be the UN system, but pulling this all together and really ending up, as I said before, with a coordination mechanism in place that really recognizes not just the UN system, the private sector, but also representatives of persons living with disabilities, women's groups, representatives of people, older people, for example, and youth, because it does require multiple dimensions, multiple scales, in order to be a, uh, have a really effective early warning system. This is just to give you an example of really how far we've come since last year. Um, where we started with an idea, 
we started with an idea that was actually um, expressed by the Secretary General to all of us who said, please, come together and find a way to help countries put in place early warning systems. And these are the countries that have systematically put in place a system to identify their gaps, to set up coordination structures, to start developing um, the capacities that they need in country to strengthen early warning. So these are the list of countries that we have collectively worked in so far this year. I've mentioned Mozambique. We came back uh, just last week from Mozambique. Um, but this week, as we speak, Haiti is taking place. And why is this important? Because I think one of the most critical elements with our early warning work is to not leave behind fragile and conflict-affected countries. And this is a real risk that we see, that those countries that are the most difficult would be the ones that are not receiving the support that they require. And often it's because climate financing, for example, isn't available. So we are doubling down on our efforts. And I would just mention that collectively the four pillars will be with the Center of Excellence for Disaster and Climate Risk Reduction releasing on the 4th of December a handbook on scaling up DRR in fragile conflict and uh, violent settings. So this was just an indication of where we are. Progress is being made, but we need a lot more focus, effort, political will. Um, and we need learning. And that's very much um, the focus of today's session. How can we learn? Um, how can we innovate? And how can we share the experiences of what we know works in countries? And that's what we will be hearing from, from our distinguished panelists, who have been asked to share with us what have been the hazards that they have been most focused on, what are some of the challenges that you've been facing, and above all, what is the learnings that you have to share with us from your experiences, and what can you recommend to others? Um, and then finally, how can this global initiative, this global goal that we share, contribute to your efforts to drive positive change and to really drive um, uh, advances in early warning systems? So with that, I would like to uh, begin, and I will introduce each panelist one by one. Uh, but it is my great pleasure to begin by introducing His Excellency Minister Matthias Magala, who is the Minister of Transport and Communications from Mozambique. And Mr. Magala is an economist, an engineer, and a politician, three ingredients we really need for early warning, I might add. Um, the floor is yours, and we're really looking forward to your comments. Thank you. No, thank you very much. Um, allow me, on behalf of uh, you can hear me? Yes. Allow me on behalf of the government of Mozambique and on my own behalf to extend my gratitude to all of you and the organizers for inviting us to be here to discuss about uh, how together we can accelerate learning and innovation in L only uh, for all initiatives for uh, adaptation. Uh, ladies and gentlemen, let me just uh, share our experience on that so that the, I can uh, illuminate better the approaches we have taken, the learning we have embraced, and the results we have achieved uh, and we, we are yet to achieve. So by framing some um, events that you all know, uh, like the cyclone Idai, uh, Kenneth and Frederick, and how through uh, these events we have uh, learned to defend our existence and that of the planet. Um, at the time of uh, the tropical cyclone Idai in 2018, we had already an air warning system established. However, the floods caused by Idai were not something that we have experienced before. Uh, the communities were, you know, were not used to that kind of uh, intensity, speed, etc. And uh, so waves were too fast to come. Communication the whole country cut. Um, and then uh, there were no time to activate. Uh, there was no time to activate the community-based systems uh, that we had in place such as we had a place called Buzi, 
where the river levels, uh, readings, and the normal uh, measurements are, are done, and then the alarm is raised across the region of the country. So that June it, it died, we could not, uh, uh, unfortunately, manage to do. Also, at the time, we're in the process of uh, uh, enhancing our capacities of National Institute of Meteorology uh, in the areas such as observation, hazard, uh, risk manage management, detention, monitoring, analysis, and forecasting of hazards and their possible consequences, dissemination of warnings and associated information on potential impacts in a timely and targeted manner, and engagement in public education and awareness about the hazard. That's the time that IDAI came and we end the process of learning, basically. Uh, on the other hand, uh, tropical cyclone <coughs> uh, Freddy, which occurred in March, exactly uh, uh, four years after he died. Um, at that time, the early system, warning systems in Mozambique had shown some improvement due to uh, our commitment and that in collaboration with partner most of which are here and they've done a great job and I'll mention a little bit more about how these partners have been instrumental in helping us to uh, you know, improve our, our own uh, uh, performance in the, in, the, in the economic system. So therefore, if we compare the two cyclones, the number of deaths in, in the Dai uh, case were 603, mm. while under Fred was uh, 183. The uh, amount of uh, um, money that was needed for reconstruction were three billion for the Dai case, dollar, American dollar, while for Freddy case was 176. Of course, you may think, okay, the, the cyclones were not the same, but it, I'm, I'm, talk, I'm talking because uh, in general assessment, the, there was indication that they were of similar magnitude, and that's why we're comparing what happened before, um, the improvement in elements uh, for one systems, and after that. So, the key changes um, were on the enhancement of tropical cyclone and uh, air warning system, where a number of actions led by the government, uh, a government uh, that committed itself to lead the charge under the leadership of our president, implemented improvements such as uh, air warning system uh, or air uh, warning actions integration of key sectors for monitoring and, uh, and disaster management, um, training of human resources, harmonization of standards, operating procedures for monitoring uh, stream event, weather events, and assessment also of responsiveness. So those are the actions that we, we have taken, uh, uh, put in place, that they helped us to improve from the die to uh, uh, Freddy. And the hopes, hopefully, as uh, we are now in the rainy season, there's a bit, and that uh, starts uh, September to March, and uh, we always have this uh, challenge, and we, we believe that we, we, we can be better prepared than ever before. So in terms of uh, association with the El Nino, 2015 and 2016, <coughs> Um, Mozambique suffered the worst drought it had seen in 35 years, uh, which uh, destroyed crops, uh, uh, livestock, and caused uh, 1.5 million people displacement, um, and also we became food insecure, um, according to UNDP 2016. It was found that uh, there was no early warning system, and that uh, uh, was uh, uh, something that we needed to improve. And of course, uh, uh, my dear friend here, uh, she has some credit in the 
and, and be the first to come and then support us in establishing that electronic system. So thank you and thank all those that were behind you uh, to make that happen. Also. Um, so as you know, drought is uh, uh, one of the main drivers of food insecurity in Mozambique, definitely. So in 2020, the World Food Program signed a memorandum of understanding with the National Institute of Meteorology, uh, the National Disaster Risk Management Institute we have, and the Ministry of Agriculture, with a view of connecting drought early warning system to anticipatory actions and program. And that's what I was talking about. Uh, before about. Uh, the Institute is now able to generate state-of-art national and sub-national seasonal, uh, seasonal forecasts and monitor drought, uh, trigger threshold using blended satellite and station data. So given the transformative change in institutional capacity to design, implement, and coordinate the drought anticipatory actions program, uh, with government owned drought anticipatory action plan, uh, as well as uh, an umbrella framework harmonizing all drought anticipatory action plan in the country, Mozambique is now in a better position and better prepared to face the present day El Nino event. In fact, uh, forecasts are that uh, uh, for this rainy season, we'll have El Nino uh, in Mozambique. So, the key changes uh, used to enhance the early warning system for hazard relevant to El Nino are mainly the government commitment, policies and legislation updated and harmonized. It's very important. And of course, uh, institutional capacity building. Most of the time, we have the system that will lack capacity and that is uh, very critical for success. But we cannot succeed if we don't work together, private sector and public sector, hand in hand. Resources are scarce and are limited, so we can amplify our uh, reach and also our impact by working together, private sector and the public sector. So, air warning and action system are feasible, disaster uh, risk reduction and climate adaptation measure um, that save lives and it provide a return on investment. In this regard, Mozambique had a kickoff workshop to launch the development of national action plan for the initiative, taking in consideration that Mozambique is one of the 30 countries, as was shown here, eligible to benefit from financial support uh, from the UN system for the establishment of an effective and learning system in Mozambique. Uh, we have seen an active involvement from the lead organizations and agencies uh, of this initiative and key stakeholders from government and international organizations, media and civil society. The launch and the rollout of the national plan was the event uh, that demonstrated the level of commitment of Mozambique in mobilizing and materializing initiatives of this magnitude. So last but not least, allow me to share with you uh, some good news. Um, uh, always when we come to COP, we uh, come with the hope that they are always good news. We need them to protect uh, uh, lives and the planet. So, the sixth steering committee meeting on the systematic observation finance facility, known as SOFT, date on, on 27 November 2023, just recently, has approved the investment phase funding request of Mozambique, the magnitude of about $7.5 uh, million for the next five years. We owe you gratitude for believing in us and investing in, the, in a better future for our people and our family. I really want to say thank you all for your attention. 
Merci beaucoup. Chokra, muy obrigado. Thank you so much. And, and what an excellent example of how investing in early warning saves lives. It's very clear when you have two hazards of a similar magnitude and you see a decrease in losses and damages and lives saved. It's really uh, a gratifying um, information to share and also another reason why investing in early warning is so important. So thank you for that, Minister. I would now like to turn to Tobias Fuchs, who is the Director for Climate Environment Services at Deutsche Wetterdienst, which is the German <laughs> National Meteorological Service, also associated with Copernicus, which is a very important source of climate information, as well as Vice Chair of the Study Group of the WMO's Integrated Weather and Climate Services for Transition to Net Zero Energy. So the floor is yours. Please to share your experiences. Thank you. Um, yeah, okay. Well, I will talk about uh, flash floods in Germany in 2021. That's an event we thought we have very good early warning systems in Germany, and they are very developed and are capable to protect our citizens, but in this case we were wrong. And I will talk about also about the reasons then. <coughs> First of all, it's, it's, it, that it was a large-scale precipitation event at that time, a very slowly moving um, low-pressure system with heavy rainfall, but not with extreme rainfall. So it was a bit more than 200 millimeters, but within a day or so, but in a large region. Our forecasts were excellent, so really we could see two days in advance that such a big presentation event would come. So we could also prepare, we could also communicate on that. But um, it triggered um, a flash flood in a small valley, a very steep valley, which with consequences we did not expect and it happened I think more than 100 years ago the last time so even the memory of the people was not present at all. So this is a river which usually has a level of about one meter, very nice region for holiday and for hiking and cycling and whatever you want to do and, it, and if there's really some, some flash flood usually they have a flood level of about three or four meters this is, of course, an event you have to prepare, but people are used to that. They know they fill some sandbags and protect in the lower parts of the town. Uh, they protect their goods, they have some time, and that's it. But at that time, this, this heavy precipitation triggered a, a flash flood wave, which was about <laughs> double or even more, almost triple, like this extreme event before. So it was not, as it usually is, one meter. It was not like three or four meters when you have an, a flash flood already in that valley but it was between eight and 10 meters or even more, and also within a few hours. And so people, and uh, even as it was forecasted by us, and it, uh, there's also, if we talk about Europe also, we have a flood early alert system of the European Commission. This also in, provided some information in advance. So all this information was present already, but we were not prepared, or people living there were not prepared for such a big extreme event, extreme extreme event, I would say, uh, which, which happened at that time. So the, the main point was then the communication didn't work well. Uh, so there were also then afterwards then in investigations, who's to blame? It was clear it's not the Met Service, so we, we really did our job in an excellent way, but we are only the beginning of the information chain. We do the precipitation forecast, then concerning floods, it goes to the uh, state level because flood uh, prediction and flood management and protection is a, is, a, is a state activity in Germany. It's not, not done on the, on the federal level. They have do their um, flood forecasts, so they run their systems. That was also communicated. And this is then com uh, communicated to the local civil protection agencies and to the people then uh, working then in order to, pre uh, to, to do the, the, the civil protection at, at the local level. And this communication was not in an optimum way. So at the people at the end of the chain expected a, a normal flash flood, as to say, we have some time, save your goods, go into the basement, take your, take your time. Of course, you have to hurry, but it's a, it's a normal event. But in that event, they would need to have to say, stop with all the things you are doing, move to higher places, and wait until the flood is over. And so, and 
yeah, but that that did, did that didn't happen so happen so and so the, the, the message is even the communication between the, the federal level, the sixteen state levels in Germany. Of course, we have not flashlights all the time in all the states, but but then down to the municipal level, that's that's the uh, activity we need to address in a, in a better way and also to understand and to help the disaster agencies what to expect in such a case of a flash flood and what to do. And so the lessons learned then be from, from this um, system or the, from this event, of course, we had a lot of talks inside of Germany, what can we do better? We have now a closer consultation between the Met Service or us and the hydro agencies and the states. And so we do co-design then also of further development of our forecast model, also of the communication and try also to improve the understanding and the communication of the disaster impacts then in case of such extreme events especially uh, to the disaster management entities and to the decision makers and to the citizens. Uh, one thing to improve the communication is that we develop now, led by the MET service but also supported by other federal agencies, a multi-hazard early warning platform. This is something we didn't have in Germany before. Mm -hmm. Of course, we issued warnings in many different communication chains, also via smartphones, we have a weather app on the smartphone, but what needed to have been done is at that time, and now we will do that, we have this platform, multi-hazard early warning platform, which will inform in case of warnings immediately, of course, but it will inform also in case of early alerts already that we can see already in, in sub-seasonal forecasts and in medium range forecasts, there is an indication of an event. It's not fully clear. We don't have no exact location and magnitude, but there's something which might come. Please prepare. We include also preventive information, so, so disaster risk maps then, so that people also can get information about the risk at their place, their lift, but also in case of holiday, they are just at, at, at a place then because of other reasons than living, but for some time. And also including some information what to do in case of floods, which, which level. That's, that's one thing, so we, we, that's in our hand at the at MET service. But also we have uh, exchange with our federal civil protection agency. There we will now start also in case of really extreme floods, a cell broadcast so that then people can get information on their, on their smartphone in a specific region only, in case of such an extreme event, there's short range message, um, this is really a, an alarm, please, please go to higher places. There's discussion also in that context then to, to provide, inter interrupt the TV program and radio program, provide messages then via TV and via radio. Um, and so this is something we are, we are working on and hope to prepare them and to mitigate uh, the impact of such extreme events. At, from the Met Service side, of course, we work also on improvement of our, further improvement of our <laughs> warning system. We develop now impact-based warnings in mm -hmm. better way so that people can adjust also their alert level individually then in future on our, on our information platform. And we will also have a change of the law of the German Weather Service. This is also important as we are a national federal agency. Of course, our mandate is to protect and inform, inform about extreme events, but we didn't have so far a mandate to, um, to run a multi-hazard early warning system, so a, a portal, a, a platform for that. And so now we, we try to get also a mandate by law to have such a multi-hazard uh, portal mm -hmm. in Germany, which is run by DWD, but of course it's fed not only by the weather information, but by hazard information from all different agencies in Germany, from the uh, federal level, but also from the state level. So, and this is also something that should be then a one-stop uh, shop for hazard and disaster information issued by different agencies, of course, but this is the one information platform Then, in future everybody can look. And so we have also a closer activity now in science to translate with social scientists how to communicate in a, in a better way, so how to translate the scientific information by us, but also by the, the hydrologic agencies into impacts information uh, understood by the people at the, at the local level. So we learned also that we need to do something on, on that in a better way. And of course, this is not only done in Germany, but we have a close exchange also on international level. We have European activities on the, on the, on the 
a, a network of the European MET services, and of course, we closely contribute to early warning for all. So we are also uh, closely cooperating in the uh, early warning for all um, group, then developing this, this system in a, in a further way. Uh, the, we support also the climate risk early warning system su supported by WMO and we support also the observation side, so the soft, uh, so this is not, uh, so this is all activities we, we contribute from the German side and feed also our information in into international activities where others are uh, doing and addressing hazards and these extreme events will increase in number and in magnitude by, by further progressing of climate change, so we all need to do more about that and so, and yeah, so to summarize, we didn't expect such an event to happen in Germany. We thought really we were protected and we learned there's a lot to do even in such a highly developed country like Germany in case of such extreme, extreme events. And we tried to learn out of that and try also to provide this information we learned also to others. And yeah, that's my, my suggestion. Thank you so much, Tobias. The, the learning from Germany is so critical because I do believe, especially with the early warning for all that has such a focus on least developed countries and small island developing states, that we risk losing um, focus on the fact that even developed countries, early warning systems are complex and they require multiple levels of communication and they do not always succeed. It's not just Germany, I'm thinking of Hawaii, for example, in the United States and fires in California and elsewhere. Um, so it's so critical that we all collectively um, are sharing these experiences and learning from them. So thank you very much for sharing that. And with that, I would now like to go to Amanda McCarty, who is the Senior Advisor in the Office of the Special Presidential Envoy for Climate, where you are working on climate negotiation, mitigation, adaptation, and science efforts. Um, and you have negotiated on behalf of the United States in various fora. Um, we would really like to hear your perspective, so thank you very much. Thank you for having me. Um, as you can imagine, with such broad geographic distribution, the United States faces a number of impacts, but what we've seen with wildfires across the United States and the most recent devastating fires in Hawaii, um, it was clear that this was an area that would be helpful for us to focus on, um, given how much attention it's garnered, how much impact it's had, and how much we still have to learn in this space. We know the United States is not alone, um, but we are dedicated to working with others in this space. So as, the, as climate change continues to warm our planet, it's clear that fire seasons around the world, but also in the U.S., are likely to become longer with more damaging fires. These fires are threatening American lives, property, and ecosystems. Research is showing that changes in climate are creating warmer, drier conditions that will lead to longer and more active fire seasons. So this is only going to get worse, not better. Already on average, each year in the United States, wildfires destroy 2,800 homes, kill 30 people a year, and burn more than 7 million acres. Smoke from wildfire also causes numerous health issues. So we're talking about near-term impacts, but also long-term impacts. According to a recent study by our National Institute of Standards and Technology, the annual average cost for damages and suppression of wildland fire is between 89 and 438 billion US dollars. We are talking about serious impacts here. Given the significant impacts to lives, livelihoods, and ecosystems, the United States is prioritizing adaptation strategies to minimize the impacts of increasing wildfires. Climate and weather information are a critical component of our wildfire preparedness. Within the United States, meteorologists from NOAA's National Weather Service work on the front lines to support those who are preventing and fighting mm. wildfires. They're collaborating closely with state and local fire control agencies, as well as our Forest Service and other federal agencies. The National Weather Service employs an expanding cadre of approximately 100 experienced incident meteorologists who are working on to support wildfire operations in remote locations across our country. These specialized meteorologists provide weather forecasts, assist with fire crew safety, and provide tactical support to the fire management teams. These specialized meteorologists require specific training 
as well as logistical and administrative support similar to that of first responders or military units. These are not easy things to execute by any means. It is imperative that when building out a cadre of special meteorologists, meteorologists, the administrative and logistical support personnel are also built out at the same time to ensure that early warnings, information, and forecasts in this space are used appropriately and can make the difference that we know they can. Universities and other industry partners have been playing a critical role in our efforts to address wildfires as well. With many outstanding questions about how a changing climate will impact specific burning conditions and a need for understanding of how people will understand and react to fire information and early warnings, research by agency, academic, and industry partners is much needed. There is so much we do not know in this space. These entities are also important from an operational perspective. For example, the United States Drought Monitor provides weekly drought maps based on assessments of regional scale drought conditions. This these, um, these maps are produced by the National Drought Mitigation Center at the University of Nebraska-Lincoln, the National Oceanic and Atmospheric Administration, and the U.S. Department of Agriculture in conjunction. You cannot produce this type of information with um, just hydro um, met services alone. Partnerships like these are absolutely critical. Successful wildland fire mitigation and management require federal, state, and local ma uh, land management agencies, emergency managers, fire departments, and scientists working together to build, provide, and support the use of these services. Thinking beyond wildfires to so the breadth of climate impacts and climate information needed to prepare for them, the United States greatly welcomes the United Nations Secretary General's call for the Early Warning for All initiative by 2027 and acknowledge how important it has been to galvanizing the international community to help protect everyone from hazardous weather and climate events. We know that deaths from these events are preventable and that early warning systems are one of the most effective measures to save lives. We also know this is most critical for those who are most vulnerable to these extremes and who are often the people least responsible for causing the problem. This is why through the President's Emergency Plan for Adaptation and Resilience, PREPARE, the United States is leaning in on the expertise of NOAA and other federal agencies to support the development, delivery, and use of climate information services, including early warnings for vulnerable developing countries around the world. In the last year alone, the United States has announced more than $50 million in new efforts to support global observations through the Systematic Observation Financing Facility, the SOF, as well as data sharing efforts. We're working bilaterally and multilaterally on modeling systems, on, um, on building capacity through trainings, and on partnerships with countries around the world, including some of the countries represented at this, at this table. This is truly a global, a global challenge that requires global coordination, and we're grateful to the UN for all their efforts in, in helping us move forward. Um, we do truly need to work together so that the U.S. could share what we've learned domestically, build on that expertise, invest in resources that help bring that out, out to the world. We look very much forward to working together to develop, deliver, and support the use of climate information, including early warnings for fires, for droughts, for floods, for storms, and for many other impacts of climate change to come. Um, it is critical at this time for building the resilience and adaptive capacity all around the world. Thank you. Thank you very much, and thank you for focusing on wildfires. From the perspective of UNDRR, this is the one area where um, we are increasingly getting requests from national disaster management agencies on how can they put in place better preventative measures. And I've really seen this evolution just in the five years that I've been at the UNDR. There's a real um, interest in this. So the learning from the US will be extremely important. So thank you for sharing that. Um, I'd now like to turn to Mr. Kashuk uh, Suturaman, and I hope I'm pronouncing your name right, head of, head of Technical Program Management for META, Social Impact Organization, which invests in socially important topics such as uh, equity, fundraising, crisis initiatives, and you have um, been involved in product uh, strategy vision, leading the development and execution of several products that is making an impact to the lives of millions of global communities over the past six years eager to hear about them. Thank you. Thank you. Um, first of all, thank you to the, uh, the WMO for uh, inviting Meta and me to speak here. Your Excellency, distinguished panelists, uh, ladies and gentlemen, a very good evening. 
Um, so I'm going to make some remarks on those five topics that uh, you know, was described. So starting with the hazard of uh, concern. First off, Facebook has a product suite called as crisis response. And the objective of the Facebook crisis response is to consolidate crisis information and then allow that crisis uh, you know, uh, to users as tools uh, to support them from recovering from natural disaster events. So the big focus for us has been after a natural disaster event occurs, like fires, floods, as has been talked about, and also hurricanes and so on, uh, we create and launch this product for that community so that they can find communication experiences or community help, which is a help experience within themselves, to become resilient to these crises. Now, when it comes to the hazard of concerns, two things come to mind for us. One is, how can we do more, um, being a social media platform and, and being in this space for a long time? One thing comes to mind is that why wait until the crisis actually has occurred? Why not explore um, the aspect of alerts and hence the connection with early warnings here? The second part is we've been um, accustomed to working with the typical crisis categories, right? Like floods, fires, storms, and hurricanes, and we all know that. But the thing that we are noticing a lot more is these extreme weather events, like you know, extreme heat, extreme um, you know, winds, and also extreme water-related incidents as well. So that's kind of our focus for the first topic on hazards of concern. Now going to the second one, which is the biggest challenge that we face. As we all know, natural disasters are complex and dynamic. Uh, it's very hard to keep track uh, of them. But they also cause a very unusual problem, which is they cause an issue of even challenging what is usually taken for granted as universally accessible technology solutions. Right? We take them for granted. We're here today. We have all these 5G and, and so on. One of core strengths for Meta is reaching people. We not only um, orient ourselves to reaching people, but we also consider the relationship with people to be super important. So that's been our strength. But even in that reaching people, we have a few challenges. Challenge number one, there is no internet connectivity, as you all know, we've all been there. Second, there's no electricity in some of these places. So how do you reach these people? So that's challenge number one. The second problem is also related to reach, which is, as I said, um, crises are dynamic, um, you know, like we've discussed here. How do you provide near real-time information to those same people as, as and when these crises happen? It has to be relevant and it has to be near real-time. The third, we simply cannot consider a world where there's going to be a unified communication channel. There will be a fragmented communication channel because of affordability, because of access, and because of preference. So in those cases, there's fragmentation of reach as well. So those are the challenges that we think all related to reaching people. In terms of learnings, so the Facebook crisis response product suite has been around for nine and a half years, nine plus years. Mm -hmm. And um, we've seen strong, sustained, positive engagement and response from our users globally. Um, there are lots of learnings, obviously, in nine plus years, but four things come to mind. Uh, first one is around users. Um, people almost always, invariably, are the first responders, the crucial first responders in any crisis. Second, uh, people in a crisis we call uh, crisis communities, they are so uniquely adapted to quickly unite and support each other. The third one is um, information. Various communication methods are always inherent when a crisis happens. You've all been there. Some people use WhatsApp, some people use Telegram. You, you suddenly look for uh, you know, text messaging service, so on and so forth. And in that aspect, we want to make sure that information to be received and information to be dispersed to the communities has to be something that uh, any, any kind of system has to be open for. Last but the most important one, access to technology does definitely enhance safety awareness and community response. This is a very important part um, where I think as a technology company, as a technology platform, we believe that we can be one of those um, mechanisms, important mechanisms to share from the med service as an example and, and with the relationship with governmental agencies to make sure that messaging can actually happen. Uh, talking about the fourth uh, remark around the um, you know, uh, recommendation for others, I'll use a simple um, framework, what, what we call five Cs. So the first one stands for context. So it's very important to quickly understand where, what, when, how about a crisis. The second one is the content. You, you totally illustrated that, Tobias. Um, content is, is so important because there are different types of messaging that needs to happen depending on the type of users. Too cryptic, nobody cares about it. Too frequent, nobody wants to know about it. Right? 
And the third part is the channel. The third C is the channel. Like, and that's what we talked about is how do you reach people where they are, making sure that they get the information at the right time and at the right place. The fourth one is community. We have entered a new world where there are new forms of communities that we need to talk about, not just based on vulnerable populations. There is urban populations of Germany we need to worry about. There's obviously the indigenous populations. There are so many micro populations in the community that we really need to understand what do they need before, during, and after a crisis in order to really make sure that early warning for all is not, not just a broadcast, but it's an ongoing relationship that we have with people so that the next time it comes around, there will be resilience uh, in that. And the last one is collaboration. I think, I think the WMO did a fantastic job here by having people all the way from uh, the ministry, uh, you know, His Excellency, all the way down to you know, uh, somebody who's going to talk about what it means to work on the field. And that collaboration between um, the signal sources, the med agencies, the global organizations, the governments, uh, technology platforms, and product experiences, which is a very important part of what we want to consider from a technology perspective, is a strong recommendation for others. And uh, as, as the slide says, one of the, um, as uh, Honorable Minister said, um, ending with some positive news as well from our side. Uh, so the early warning for all very, very closely connects with our mission, which is to bring awareness and resilience to communities in crisis. And we have started working on a very small pilot as a part of experiment, uh, where we've chosen four countries, four focus countries from the WMO. And we are in the process of trying to work with the signals that we get from the MET agencies in those particular places, and then try to see uh, and explore what would be these valuable outcomes that we can get by experimenting uh, early warnings for all in, in these countries. Three positive outcomes we hope to achieve. One, which is um, um, essentially community engagement. We believe that having shared responsibility from the, within the community is very important for this to work. The second one is enhanced preparedness. Lowering the uh, impact, lowering the cost, increasing resilience is what we hope from that. And the last one is technological innovation. Right? It's not just about accessibility or efficiency or timeliness of information or reliability, but we think it's a combination of all of those that's very important from a technology perspective. And of course, um, not to mention the uh, advances in AI, which we hope will help in preparation, which will help in essentially making sure that there's personalized recommendation and prediction that can also happen. So with that, I thank you. Thank you very much. driven home the message that we are living in an age of communication and I think one of the things that's important is that these various communication channels need to reinforce each other and when people are familiar with communication channels such as what you're discussing having the platforms that they're used to it's a way of building trust as well which is so important so thank you for that and now our last uh, panelist is Mr. Gustavo de Carvalho Figuera who is the Director of Communication and Engagement from the SOS Pantanal Institute in Brazil. Um, Gustavo is a biologist, a specialist in wildlife management and conservation, and has been very much on the front line of dealing with wildfires in Pantanal. So we're eager to hear your experiences. Well, thank you very much. I thank WMO for the invitation. And what I'm about to say is on a much uh, smaller scale than everybody else is saying, but it, it is very effective. It has proven very effectively, uh, such as last week I was fighting fire in Pantanal and I was using the system that I'm about to, to explain to you. So basically, I don't know if everybody is aware, but in 2020, Pantanal faced the worst wildfires on its history by uh, around 3.3. 3.9 million hectares were burned in Pantanal. And for a biome that is not as big as Amazon, like by far, it's a small biome compared to Amazon and other, other biomes in Brazil, it's a very, very big amount of area. More than 17 million back, uh, vertebrates were, were killed and uh, it was uh, uh, such a huge impact that Pantanal hasn't even uh, recovered itself from it. And we have faced again fires in 2021, and now 2023, as I said, like one week ago, I was fighting fire in Pantanal uh, with some people that are here in the, uh, as well. Uh, but what we learned from 2020 is that we cannot only work with combat fire, we have to work with prevention. And by prevention, I do not only mean uh, 
creating brigades, but also giving these alerts. So basically what SOS Pantanal did on 2020 is that we created a program called the Pantanal Brigades, where we helped to structure 24 brigades, uh, mixed brigades, within communities, traditional communities, and farmers, uh, uh, local properties. Uh, these spread brigades, they give a much faster response to wildfires. But we understood that this was not only the, uh, this was not the only thing that must be done. So uh, on this year, we launched the uh, Aranquan system. Aranquan is, uh, is a bird in Pantanal, and it's known by giving these huge alerts. They scream so loud when they see a predator or uh, a danger coming. So we gave this name, Aranquan, to the system because basically what we did, and here you can see uh, those, those screen prints that I took from my cell phone. So uh, you can see this, uh, the Aranquan system. Uh, we got NASA's uh, satellites uh, uh, fire focus to uh, this system. Basically, they scratch along NASA's uh, system. And whenever they find a fire focus within the, the areas, the buffer area protected by the brigades, they give, an, they give this alert. So they get this alert and send to the people uh, on the site by WhatsApp. And this is where Meta is coming. You were asking like, about technology, where it's reaching. We are using Meta's technology to give these people alert. Basically, in Pantanal, uh, uh, lots of people has uh, internet access, which is very good. And they have smartphones. So, if they are part of a Pantanal, uh, of a Pantanal Brigade, they receive this alert uh, as, as soon as the fire is detected, so they can see in the map where the fire is. So basically what we see here, it, it is in Portuguese, but I'm going to translate. So basically it says, Gustavo, we have detected one fire focus on the, on the area of the uh, São Pedro da Joselândia Brigade, which was one of the Pantanal Brigades. And then I say, I want to. Of course, we have to enhance it. It's the phase one project, but we, 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 want, we want to make it better. But as long as I say, yes, I want to receive, then he sends all the KMZ shape files with the, fires, uh, with the fire spots. So people receive it, and they can open on their smartphones, and they see exactly where the fire is and when, was, when it was detected. So as you can see here on the other image, it shows all the fo focus points and this is from like two weeks ago. The, the sprints are from two weeks ago on the Transpantanal region, on the northern Pantanal. And with this, plus the brigades trained and well equipped, we have reduced more than 80% of the burnt area within the buffer areas of the brigades. So basically what we see here is that we must work with prevention, not only by managing the land uh, with fire man management on the, the territory, but also with these early warning alerts. This is why I said that w uh, what, what we're doing is on a much smaller scale than everybody else here, but it's ha it has been uh, working very effectively. So uh, this is a phase one project, as I said. Uh, we are ready, we are, uh, we are doing all the tests and we are ready for more investments to make it better and make it more accurate, but it is already working. Like people are already using this uh, to protect their, their land, not only their land and wildlife, but their houses as well. So this is an example I wanted to bring. The, uh, Pantanal is the largest wetland on earth. Maybe uh, many people here don't know it, but uh, it is drying because of the climate changes. Pantanal depends so much on water that comes from the outside and it is drying. As the Amazon is drying, the, the water that comes from the Amazon uh, is, is coming less from the surroundings of Pantanal where the water comes from. And the tendency is that these wildfires, these extreme events are going to happen even more rusher on, on the next years. So this is only the step one. We need, so, we need to do so much more, but this is a, a light in the end of the tunnel that, yes, we can do that. And people who are on the, on the territory suffering with these wildfires, they can be warned. As, as early as possible. So that's it. Thank you very much for listening. Thank you so much. And I think it's fabulous that we've ended with the note of prevention, obviously, because that's really what it's all about, preventing the impact of 
climate-induced disasters on communities before they occur. So really, thank you for that. And we will be eager to follow the progress of this project. And we'll invite you next year and the next year and the next year <laughs> to tell us how it's evolving. So with that, we are now going to hand over to my colleague, uh, Dr. Jonathan Stone, um, as I mentioned before, pillar four lead, um, who is going to walk us through an exercise uh, before we wrap up. So thank you, Jonathan. Great, thank you, Laurie. And thank you to the participants for some, I'm getting quite close to the steps there, for some fantastic um, comments. So what we wanted to do with this segment of the session was to get you, the audience, um, or for me, from the Red Cross, I'd call you the community uh, in this context here, want you to interact with what we've discussed today. So my name's Jonathan Stone. I'm from the International Federation of the Red Cross Red Crescent Societies. And um, what we've got for you just now are some cartoons, OK? Now, be warned, some of these cartoons you might find slightly provocative. Um, that's our hope. We hope that by engaging with these, you can think some new thoughts about early warnings for all. You can think some new thoughts about multi-hazard early warning systems. And you can have some questions that might challenge some of the presenters. Um, so often, I'm sure this resonates with you when we think of innovation. It often takes a brave one uh, to do this. Um, the next one, with full apologies to the panelists, I didn't realize quite how interesting your talks would be before <laughs> I did this one. Um, but this is normally, I think, how many of you will feel about some of these segments of these sessions. Um, we talk to you, and then we ask you to kind of tell you what we think. But obviously, you've all been incredibly engaged by the panelists so far. So again, we want to provoke a little bit. Um, here we go. I think this, this really uh, kind of touches on a few topics here. Um, about sometimes our, our motivations for acting early our motivations for responding to warnings, and just how difficult we find it, okay? Acting early or kind of working on a warning takes a little bit of effort. This again, hopefully, will prompt some thoughts amongst you all. And um, huge thanks, of course, to our colleagues from the Red Cross Red Crescent Climate Center and the Anticipation Hub who, who worked with these fantastic cartoonists. To, they've been listening to all of you, this community, for several years. And this is the kind of things that they're coming up with. <laughs> okay. And then um, this one. I know sometimes I have conversations uh, with my partner about this one. We're sipping through our paper straw that's dissolving. And uh, yeah. But you know, this really resonates, I think, I think with a lot of you about what, what it is that we're here to discuss at COP. OK, so um, we want you to kind of have a look at these cartoons, to engage with them a bit, and uh, to share some reflections. I hope the online bit of this is going to work nicely for people uh, online, and I also hope that for you in the audience, you'll be able to engage nicely with this as well. So what you will do in a minute when I show a QR code is you'll access a website, and it's something called a cartoon gallery. And what it will do is it will show you these cartoons that you've seen so far, and a couple of extra ones. You will all get slightly different ones, perhaps, but you'll, you'll see them all. Um, and you can leave your comment there, OK? So it can be a comment, it can be a question, it can be a load of emojis, whatever it is that you want. It can be directed at the panel, can be directed at each other. Um, you could put your name if you want, but I encourage you to be anonymous, because I, <laughs> I think when we're anonymous, we tend to say what we think a little bit more. So um, this is what you do. You click Submit. OK, they've given us some kind of idiot's guide to it. And then you click Next. And as you click Next, you'll see the next cartoon you'll go through. What you then do, once you've kind of clicked through all the cartoons, you can go back. And as people put their comments in, you can see what each other has written. What we're going to do after that is you're going to turn to the kind of person next to you or someone kind of nearby you. Um, and I want you to discuss what the cartoons made you think about, what they made you think about compared to these fantastic presentations of real world examples of this. Um, and then, and then have a think about it. And, and the, the whole point of this is how, how does this connect to the learning and innovation that we desperately need um, in, this, in this area of work? OK, over to you. Here is the QR code. So in case you've been living under a rock and not seen one of these before, you scan it with your phone. 
You could also type that um, short link in, and hopefully the internet <laughs> works. Can someone wave at me maybe when they're on? Okay, people are on. So again, you can be anonymous or not, if you like. Um, click that, click the little arrow, and it should load the gallery. And you'll randomly get assigned different cartoons, and you can leave your comment. Again, some of the cartoons are designed to provoke um, reaction, so please don't be too offended by any of them. I can definitely start to see some comments coming online. And do keep the link after this session ends, because you can look at this again later when we run out of time if you want to discuss further. No, no length requirements could be short. I mean, you can write an essay. I just don't think that people would necessarily be able to see it. But so I guess a fairly short comment. It can also be funny. I'm seeing a few of you laughing, which is a good sign, I think. Great. I, I think you're all still commenting on the cartoons, or you're busy catching up on your WhatsApps. And <laughs> other other brands also accepted in this session. <laughs> Okay, great. What I would love you all to do now is um, turn to the kind of two or three people next to you, um, form into a little small discussion group. I really don't mind if you kind of mess up the chairs a little bit, but what we'd love you to do is talk to your kind of, in a group of maybe three or four, so I think that's the best kind of conversation size. Talk to your neighbors about which the cartoons, so some of them are here, some of them are online, spoke to you most, and please reflect on you know, which kind of cartoon resonated with you the most? What did it make you think of? And what's it made you think about the innovations that are needed for Early Warning for All? So group together in threes or fours, you'll have five minutes or so to chat about it. Sort of. Yes. <laughs> <laughs> 
Event organizers, mind that we have got 10 minutes left for this event. Thank you. Please, event organizers, please mind that we've got 10 minutes left for the session. Thank you. I really hate to stop you from talking. I really hate to do this. We create discussion and then we stop it because we've got to kind of obey the timings of the day. But there we go. Um, so 
I hope this was interesting for people. Has anyone got a burning comment or something that... Did someone really feel something strongly from one of these cartoons uh, that would like to share something with the room? Or you can share it with each other afterwards. I won't force anyone <laughs> to speak. Um, fantastic. So thank you so much for this. Um, just to say, the, the, um, our Red Cross Red Crescent Climate Centre has made a cartoon wall. Um, has anyone found it yet? Yes, one person has found it. Okay, so you can follow this lovely lady there um, at some point. Um, but the directions to it, so it's, it's in the main building to the right of security when you enter. And there are these cartoons and many more. Um, the reason that we do this is because, I mean, as you know, with the Red Cross Red Crescent, we're really keen on creating slightly different spaces for people to engage with things. And we found recently, particularly with this approach of cartoons, it really has opened up new ways for us to imagine things slightly differently, um, even though they are quite hard hitting. So um, please do continue to see, keep that link open on your phone so you can see what everyone's written. And um, I'm going to pass back to Laurie for the wrap up. Thank you very much. That was um, an entertaining game. And just, of course, it always makes us think, you know, do we talk too much? Do we talk too little? But I do think that sharing of experience is great. And I love this exercise. So thank you for that. What I'd like to do now is ask Johan if you'd like to take the podium and just share any final reflections on what you have heard today. I think what we've heard is that it is possible. What we've heard from Your Excellency from Mozambique, once a government commits to something that's positive for their country, by understanding the needs of those who are most vulnerable, then the international community will get, a, to get together and assist. And we've also learned from Brazil that even those small things, which they think is small, can be used by bigger countries like Germany to say, learn from us, because this is how we learn from one another. Now, I think what we've heard from each panelist, each one brings something different. But at the end of the day, it's a solution. And everybody learns from one another. I think there's some good points for the WMO, UNDRR, ITU, and IFRC to move forward together and gather this information and share with all those um, countries where we've started implementing multi-hazard early warning systems. With that, I would like to thank you, especially Your Excellency for, from Mozambique, Laurie. Um, I'm going to forget all the names. I'm just going to say all our distinguished panelists for wonderfully from our side. <clears throat> Much appreciated and excellent session. Much appreciated. Thank you. <clears throat> thank you very much. And if I could just have 30 more seconds of your time. This effort on early warnings for all is not just the four pillar leads. It really has brought together a whole group of agencies working together. Um, and sometimes they also you know, participate in a way that's a little bit behind the scenes. And I'd like just to give the floor to our colleague from FAO who's participating in today's session, the Food and Agriculture Organization. So absolutely critical for the work on early warning. If you don't mind, just a, a moment to introduce yourself and explain a little bit the importance of your contribution to early warnings for all. Yeah, well, thank you so much for inviting us here. I'm Amy Duchelle, a senior forestry officer at FAO and leading the forest and climate team. And, you know, of course, I heard about the initiative when it was first, first announced last year, but I'm really blown away by, by what you've done. And we were privileged, um, FAO and UNEP earlier this year launched the Global Fire Management Hub at the International Wildland Fire Conference and sort of immediately really started reaching out to UNDRR and most recently WMO. And re this, this initiative is absolutely fundamental to what we're trying to do with wildfire management. And, and thank you to, to Amanda and Gustavo for, for all of the work that you're doing and these kinds of lessons from leading countries that have the, the fire problem and the fire solutions. And um, I think we, from my point of view from FAO, I mean the aim of the fire hub is to strengthen countries' capacities for integrated fire management. And part of that is risk assessment and, and early warning systems. So I can only see the collaboration with you all growing and, and I look forward to it, so thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you.
you very much. And as you can see, it's a whole of system approach that's required from the private sector, civil society, the UN government. And I really want to thank all of the panelists. I learned something from each of you today. And I really think it's important that we continue to share these experiences. Um, the COP is a great opportunity to do this, but we will also be hosting multi um, stakeholder forums along with WMO and the partners over the course of the next years as really an opportunity for learning on early warning. So we'll be inviting you to that as well. Thank you all very much and enjoy the rest of the talk. Um, ladies and gentlemen, may I just please ask you to exit from the left side of the room? Thank you.